I'm Nate Warfield. Uh, I am currently the Director of Research and Threat Intelligence for a company called Eclipsium. We do firmware security research, uh, and I get to break things all day and try to fix things before the attackers figure out what we did. As Tom mentioned, I worked for MSRC for seven years. I have the dubious honor of shipping the WannaCry patch. Uh, I also worked for F5 Networks. If you were here last year, I did a whole talk about how to do horribly evil things to them. Um, I'm actually a fourth time BrewCon speaker. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, Joe, I beat you by one. <laughs> uh, I do security research. Uh, like I said, uh, I was doing it as a hobby. Now I get to do it as a job. And social media, I use the, uh, a handle that nobody seems to understand. Um, it's very simple. If you know what 0x08 in hex, it's 8. There you go, there's the joke. Oh, and I also have the best dressed kids at the playground. So, yes, that is my children. After last year, they roll around in BrewCon shirts. It's pretty cool. Um, so, kind of a quick thing on the agenda. Um, I'm sure people here are somewhat familiar with firmware. If you took Pablo's class earlier this week on IoT stuff, it's a very similar uh, sort of landscape. Um, but we're going to sort of set the ground as to why this is such an important topic these days. Um, give you some one-on-one -on -one analysis on like, what it looks like when you're trying to look at firmware from like, a vulnerability standpoint. I have some obligatory ChatGPT things, since you can't talk about InfoSec without mentioning ChatGPT, it turns out. Um, do you want to see a dead body? I don't mean real dead bodies, I mean technical dead bodies of things that are horribly insecure that I've found just in hacking around with a couple hundred firmware images this last year. Some conclusions, but what I really wanted to get to is my motivations. Um, I've done a lot of defensive talks. I think I'm at like 20 or 30 at this point. Um, last year I did an offensive talk of how do you implant load balancers and network devices with malware better than APT29. Um, but this is an educational talk. This is sort of a journey I've taken this year, diving into something that I'm not a, a subject matter expert on. So I'm kind of doing this to share, like, this is the learning process. Um, also, firmware security research is a field that has, like, nobody in it. Um, I've been trying to hire people for months, and I can't find anybody that has more than, like, I have a Raspberry Pi, and I played with it and put a pie hole in my network. Um, I'm hoping that because BrewCon has so many, like, you young people, they're very, like, welcoming to people that are just getting started in their journey in InfoSec. What I'm hoping is if you're wondering what you want to do, if you're wondering about what's a cool thing that, you know, maybe is going to be lucrative later in life because money, unfortunately, is something we all need, um, maybe this is something that interests you and it piques your interest. And also, beer. I mean, why else do we come to BrewCon? <laughs> so, uh, what is firmware? Um, so this is, uh, we're kind of talking about here, I've got some diagrams. I have this fancy new port you're going to see me using all the time. So this is somewhat of a diagram of what firmware looks like from a network device uh, system, right? A lot of these things are now running hypervisors. If we come down here, this is more of your desktop machine. You've got all these components, all these chips. Every one of these components inside your computer is running firmware. It's the tiny operating systems underneath your operating systems that control all of the hardware on your devices. It also does things like secure boot. It runs your TPM chips. Um, and unfortunately, for something that's this important, it has some egregious vulnerabilities. The other problem is that when vulnerabilities are discovered, um, it's very complex to upgrade this stuff, right? You don't just, you know, Patch Tuesday guy here, you don't just push out Patch Tuesday across your server farm to upgrade all of their BMC chips or across, you know, all of the, you know, Soho routers like Joe was talking about that just sit there becoming the next Mirai botnet. There's no way to do this uh, in a sort of an automated fashion. So we're sort of left to people need to understand that there's a risk, care about the risk, and then do something on their own, which makes this uh, problem, it's also invisible to uh, any of the DR, you know, extended XDR, NDR, whatever DR. This all lives underneath CrowdStrike and Sentinel-1 and Defender. So I can do all sorts of horrible things to your machine and firmware, and I can guarantee you CrowdStrike Falcon won't catch it. Um, all the, so we're going to be talking more about um, operational technology stuff. Stuff that runs inside data centers, stuff that runs, um, you know, big networks that's not necessarily a network device, it's not necessarily ICS, we're not talking about water pumps and, you know, sanitation systems, but this is more the things that live that people forget are connected to the internet. Why should we care? So, this is not something I'm going to go through line by line because you'll get sick of my little fancy Zoom thing, but really what's been happening, the point I'm showing you this is that this attack surface is becoming more and more prevalent, right? We go back to, say, 2011, right, where it's, you know, this one little attack. 2015, hacking team gets breached, right? These are UEFI rootkits. You know, equation group drops some stuff. We know the NSA had some stuff. But the point that I'm kind of making here is that if we look towards 
the, the cadence, right? There was 2011, 2015, 2018, a couple in 2020, a couple in 2021, four in last year. As this has not been updated for 2023, or it would be a literal eye chart just because of the, the prevalence of these attacks. So yeah, firmware is uh, very hacked right now. Um, sort of the timeline, and this is fairly up to date, um, like my company, we found a bunch of BMC vulnerabilities in what's called a baseboard management controller. It's lights out management for enterprise servers. Um, we disclosed a set in December, second set in January. Um, Black Lotus is a secure boot boot kit that was publicized in March. Um, and then we started with these network device attacks, which is something I talked about last year. Um, so Fortinet gets attacked by, I want to say that's Russians, Chinese, one of the two. MSI gets breached, all their source code get dumped. For all those who don't know, MSI is a humongous motherboard company, right? There was a lot of press of like, oh my god, people can sign malicious updates in firmware. And it's like, okay, you can, but once again, people don't install firmware updates. So is that really the problem? Back in May, my company found a gigabyte backdoor, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then we see this sort of like one after one after one, like Barracuda gets hit. Um, the uh, US, um, I think it was the US and the NSA says, hey, we have this binding operational directive, which is basically a big, you have to do this from the US government, saying, shut off the management addresses for your network devices that are still plugged into the internet because it's 30 years after we knew this was a problem and people still do it. Uh, and then in July, there was a Citrix ODA that was announced. I'm not going to go into the Citrix stuff. If you want to see, I did a talk last year at BrewCon that I go way into detail about what you can do to a Citrix. Um, if you're interested, go watch it or talk to me later. And then September, Mandiant talks about how Chinese actors essentially, once they realized that people were catching on to what they were doing, they changed their tactics with a matter of like an hours or days to start embedding malware into configuration backups of Barracuda devices. So as Barracuda is shipping out RMA'd or replaced devices, the administrators back up the config, put the new device in, drop the config back up on it, and the malware comes back. So this is, this is becoming a systemic problem because attackers are realizing they can set up shop here and live for months or years before anybody notices, right? They get discovered because they say, oh, Active Directory got popped, and they trace the thing back, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, this came from the you know, Fortinet device, right? They didn't realize they were there until it was too late. Um, so this is something, so the US government has a uh, cybersecurity infrastructure something or other agency. Um, and they have a list of what they call the known exploited vulnerabilities. There is, it is not the exhaustive list, but it's the one that the government says you should care about these. Um, I took the liberty of going through and categorizing. You know, it's, it's you know, Windows, it's iOS, it's browsers. Um, and then I went through and said, okay, well, how many of these things are firmware, whether it be a Soho router, whether it be a Cisco router, whether it be something else? Firmware is the second most exploited vulnerability according to the US government. Um, they don't say this, they just kind of put it out as like a laundry list of stuff. But if we look at it, I mean, so I think it's server software is the most, and then two vulnerabilities behind is um, firmware, right? So this is you know, the trend. If nobody's picking up the trend, um, they should be, right? And like I said, this is an under-researched area. We're, we're losing this battle right now. So firmware analysis, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, the, the immutable law that governs the commandments to its very being. It's a pretty cool quote, right? Do you know who wrote that? <laughs> Sorry, Tom, I used that in my abstract. <laughs> so there is a lot of commercial offerings that do IoT scanning stuff, right? Um, you know, Defender has one. There's a company called OneKey that we'll get into some more detail about. There's all these companies that have started building these solutions where they say, OK, you can take your IoT firmware. If you don't know what's in it, you can upload it to us. We'll take it apart. We'll scan it. We'll tell you what vulnerabilities it might have. Um, you know, we'll do all this magic for you. I mean, that's cool, right? It's good that it exists. The problem is, is that most of these, and I've pretty much played with every single one of the or half of those offerings, they don't support a whole lot of firmware. You basically, it has to be Linux with U-boot, um, which is the sort of firmware boot image things that, that, that you know, routers or home routers and stuff use. Um, so it can't detect a lot of different, there's a lot of firmware that it can't really process. Um, it's not very good at unpacking things that aren't just basically a basic packing method that Binwalk, which is one of the tools we'll briefly cover. Um, it can't do much. And these things are really designed, they're not designed to do an exhaustive analysis Really what they do is they give you the software bill of materials. Once they have the list of software that you're running, they can say, okay, you've got you know, Apache web server here, you've got you know, whatever other programs there, these are the versions, and then they do a correlation between CVE databases and say, okay, this device has all these CVEs, 
they will also um, look at the actual binaries and say, okay, these having binary protections, right? Do they have stack canaries? Do they have um, any of the stuff that we use in modern computing to secure memory and try to make things like a buffer overflow not a thing, <laughs> which is funny. Um, and they look for crypto materials and passwords. But they're not cheap. And really what you're paying for when you use these is it's got a pretty GUI. It gives you a pretty report. You can print into a PDF. You can show your exec, say, look, these are the things we need to worry about. Whether you can get a patch for it is unknown. So how does this stuff work? Um, you have to unpack it, right? You'll get a firmware image. Most of these things come as like a .bin file or a .img file. And it's just a single file that's used to update the device firmware when you update it or what have you. Um, now, unpacking these things is hit and miss, right? When you talk about like a Netgear router, uh, most of these things you can just run a bin walk on it and it'll say, okay, you dump it out to a directory, you get a whole list of all the binaries, you know, you've got like Linux system paths with, you know, bin and sbin and home directories and everything's there and it's really easy. The problem is, is that when we move to devices like security cameras or industrial uh, fire suppression systems or HVACs or any of the big iron that I tried to really dig into earlier this year, the vendors start packing it weird. They start packing it in ways where you can't actually take it apart, or it's in the obfuscated, or it's encrypted. Um, and like I said, some walk, sometimes bin walk is enough. Sometimes there's a lot of stuff you really can't do anything with. I have a library of like four or 500 firmware images, and probably about a third of them, it doesn't know what to do, right? It just reads it and says, okay, it doesn't even give me anything. Or it tells me it's a MySQL IASM version seven database, which is not firmware. Um, OneBlob is a little better. It's actually built by that company, OneKey. And um, it kind of helps get around some of the problems that Binwalk has. It supports more of the embedded file systems that you'll see inside of firmware. Um, but actually, interestingly enough, 7-Zip turns out to be your friend. This uh, screenshot here, this is a, a Citrix uh, Netscaler device. It's Netscaler build 1319.60. I was trying to take this thing apart as part of a project of figuring out how can I look at hashes inside of firmware, how can I validate that they're good, and how can I then compare them against a network device that's running to make sure that nobody's tampered with the system binary. What Citrix does is a little trick that I found a 20-year-old blog post that explained this to me. This, uh, this is the kernel image, this whole file here, this, you know, whatever, something, you can barely see it, I apologize. Um, what they do is this MFS binary it has the kernel. This is the kernel and the file system. What they've essentially done is you say, you've got your operating system kernel. It says, okay, I'm gonna take this first chunk. And this is gonna be the cutoff point. I'm gonna stick the file system in the middle of the kernel, and then I'm gonna attach the rest of the kernel to the back of it, and it's gonna be one big data file. So there's a very weird dance that you have to do to be able to extract this thing. 7-Zip um, couldn't do this, but I found some tools that were like allowed me to pull this out, and then it's just a MFS file system that FreeBSD uses. Um, some other examples of, so this is, this is what you want to see when you're looking at firmware, right? I've unpacked this in Binwalk. I've got a SquashFS file system. I've got a uImage header. This means this is a firmware image I can actually process. This over here is a firmware image I can't process, right? It's got this XML document, and it's got this MySQL, MyASM index file version 7. Look at that. That's impossible to unpack. You go and Google what a MySQL IS some index file is, and basically you get a bunch of people saying, Benoit can't read this thing, what is it? So it's some sort of a misconfiguration in how it's looking at the, the actual header on the, on the binary file. A lot of these things, um, when you, you know, if you've, like I said, if you took Pablo's class or if you followed any of these things, you're gonna say, okay, you take it apart and then you wanna do some sort of security validation, right? You might be looking for configuration files that are wrong, you might be looking for um, weak passwords in SSH, but there's also this thing that we call static application security testing, which is essentially using software with a defined set of rules that tells you, hey, here's a pre coding practice that I know is insecure. This is a possible vulnerability. The thing with static analysis is that you need the source code, right? And for most binaries on a firmware image, they're gonna be compiled. Um, yes, they may be open source. Yes, you may be able to go back and map out the source code. That's not something that we do. Dynamic uh, um, application security testing is the version where you run the binary, and then you either instrument it or you attach a debugger, and you try to figure out, okay, is there a way that this is doing something wrong? Can I give it input that causes it to crash? Can I control the like, pointer after it crashes, et cetera? We're not talking about that today. I'm not an expert in it. I would give you a bunch of misinformation, and then you would go and not get jobs. Uh, SEMGREP, though, is the 
SaaS tool that I've started to really enjoy using. It's what some of the automated frameworks are going to talk about uses, and it does multi-language. It has an open source version, which is kind of handy, and then, of course, it has a paid version. Um, there's also Progpilot that is PHP. Um, I point this out because a lot of these firmware images use PHP as their web UIs. I mean, if we, and also if you followed the news with the Citrix exploitation, they were dropping PHP backdoors. So a lot of these devices have PHP support because they may actually use it in their web UI. So being able to do a, um, a SAS test against the UI code for this device or this you know, widget or this uh, router is very helpful because the vulnerabilities in there, it's, you'll see some in a minute. Um, but as you're going to find out is open source tools are limited. There's a lot of money in companies selling this to people, right? Everybody's like, secure this, secure that. So there's only so much you get for open source, um, and you kind of have to try to figure out a way to work around that. Um, so that's kind of where we're going. Is like, this is a limited tool set. It is useful, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, but it's, it's, all, it's all got limitations, and this is part of what the problem space in this industry is, is that unless you have a ton of money, doing this at scale is very hard. Um, firmware analysis is very slow. If you guys caught the talk yesterday with the uh, gentleman that took apart the EV charger in, I think it was Norway, that was really cool, but they didn't do it in like an afternoon. Right? This is probably a multi-day, multi-week process, um, and it's not something that scales well. Right? I was asked by my management, hey, can you take the uh, firmware images for 8,000 different models of Hikvision cameras and run them through and figure out if there's any common pattern of vulnerabilities? I can't buy 8,000 cameras, um, and even if I could, I'd probably be dead, my kids would be dead before you could actually do that type of a deep analysis. So it's also expensive. Um, I've, I've made this joke before, but I'm looking at stuff, I'm trying to look at big data center hardware, right? Your HVACs, your, you know, your fire suppression systems. Um, if anybody wants to loan me your data center and play with your stuff, I'm happy to. Um, I'll let you get the CV credit if I find it, I promise. I won't break it too bad. Um, the other thing that I found, too, is that end-of-life de uh, devices are very prevalent, right? So you've got a data center, and I worked uh, when I was at Microsoft. Part of my, my first job was data center, data center network engineering. So we had you know, 65,000 pieces of networking equipment inside our data center, probably even more other devices that were sort of the operational technology, like our KVMs to get into our Cisco routers if the thing hard locked up. Um, you know, uh, devices to get into your UPS systems, devices to get into the power breakers on your racks, right? All of these things are IP connected. And once you buy them, if it works, you don't upgrade them, right? There's no, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, and also, uh, I'm not an RE expert, and I have kind of limited time to do this. So I started looking at, can I do this at scale? Can I make this easier on myself? All right, oh my god. <laughs> So one of the tools that I've started to use is something that's called FACT. And this is made by, I'm going to butcher the name, it's, I think it's Fraunhofer Institute in Switzerland. Um, and it does an automated unpacking. You basically use a web UI. You give it a firmware image. Um, you can kind of see over here. Oops, hold on, wrong thing. There we go. Um, you can kind of see, this is a list of, from my device. These are like, so Hikvision's a camera. There's some industrial routers I've been looking at, some BMC stuff from Supermicro, Citrix load balancers, and that's one of like six pages of stuff that I've been playing with. But it'll take it apart. It'll run the basic analysis that I was telling you about. So it's got this stuff here where you say, okay, what do you want to do? Bin walk. You can look for crypto material, CVEs. Um, you can look at you know hashes, hardware lookups. Um, software components, and you can choose and pick and choose which ones of these you want to actually have it analyzed for. Each one of them creates its own uh, exponential amount of time that's taken, right? If you want to do a CWE analysis, it's basically decompiling binaries and looking at symbols inside them, and that takes days sometimes. Um, but it does vulnerability identification. It's basically doing what most of these paid-for tools do, and then it can also do things like emulating it in QMU, which for the uninitiated is a virtualization um, platform, if you will, that lets you run images and you can kind of play with them like you're actually running the device and emulate things like an ARM processor or a MIPS processor on your Windows computer or your Linux computer. It's got a database backend, which is handy if you, you know, don't like the command line like I do. Um, and it's fairly fast with a fairly powerful VM. It's not the slowest thing. Um, it's not my tool of choice. That's not to say there's anything wrong with it. I've worked with this team here, found some bugs or found some misconfigurations. They're very responsive. It's a great tool. I'm just a command line nerd, so I, to me, using a GUI is kind of like cheating. 
This is the tool I really like. Um, it's called Embedded Analyzer, or we call it Emba. I obviously like it enough that I have its sticker on my laptop. Uh, it's command line only, and it gives you uh, web reports. And funny, it's got he's using frames, which I haven't seen since like GeoCities. Um, but it's really useful, and it has a ton of stuff. Um, I'll give you kind of the quick rundown here. So it's got these different tests, right? It's taking your file analyzers, it's taking apart everything, analysis prep, it's looking at all sorts of stuff. This actually goes on for three pages that I didn't have space to put in these slides. Um, and I'm not going to zoom in on those other screenshots because it's going to give away some of the fun stuff I have later. But what it also does, so it does everything FACT does. But then it also looks at that, uh, that CISA list of known exploited vulnerabilities I was telling you about, and it will say, oh, you know, because if, sometimes it'll pull up and it'll be like, yeah, there's nine or 3,000 CVEs that affect this device. Most of these are local vulnerabilities. It's Linux kernel stuff, it's libraries, it's not necessarily remotely exploitable, but it looks for everything. And then when it sees vulnerabilities that have been exploited in the wild, it'll tell you, hey, there's three vulnerabilities that have been known to be exploited by threat actors. So it gives you a little bit more context as to the risk. It also generates SBOMs, which, you know, SBOM is kind of this new hotness. Everybody wants SBOM this and, you know, supply chain that. But it'll actually generate an SBOM report. Um, fact isn't quite there yet. Um, and it's in a Cyclone DX format for those of you who care about this stuff. <laughs> All good. Um, and yes, it does also do exploit data. So it'll look at um, vulnerabilities that have known exploits. It'll basically break it down and say, there's all these vulnerabilities. Here's the ones that are known. Here's the ones that actually have active exploits available for them versus the theoretical. It was patched as a vuln, but nobody built a POC. And it uses SEMGREP, right? It does do uh, actual analysis of PHP or some of the other code pages that SEMGREP can analyze. And it has a chat GPT integration, which is experimental. And I, trust me, I have slides on that too. It is my favorite tool. I actually support these guys on GitHub, or it's, I think, two guys. Um, they're really, out, really nice people. I highly recommend you check this out if you're interested in this stuff. But like any good tool, it has its drawbacks. Um, Emba is, <laughs> Emba has got 76 different modules that it runs when you open up a firmware image. Uh, 44 of these are test modules, and then there's 17 different modules that it uses just to try to take things apart, prep it, get it ready to go. And then it's got a whole bunch of other, whatever 44 plus 17, taken away from 76 is, of sort of reporting modules. This thing can take anywhere from two days, or two, two to 36 hours at least per analysis. If you put a large image, I've had it run for four days. Um, like I said, this is, it's not, it's, this process is not fast, even at an automated fashion. So there's ways to tune this, right? If you're going to do this and you want to play around with it and you maybe you don't have a lot of processing power, check out what they call a module blacklist. You can, and this is literally mine. Trust me, I learned all of this the hard way. Um, I actually fried the CPU on my little VM server doing this. It started throwing all sorts of weird errors. I basically replaced every other component and then put a new CPU in. I was like... I burned the CPU out doing this. Um, but you can disable some of the checks that take a long time, and that speeds things up like exponentially. You can also tell it, you know, I'm not going to give you the man page for it, but you can read the docs and it'll say, okay, if you just want to one, run one test and just test a specific thing, you can. Um, I did this for some of the vulnerability analysis that I'm going to talk about in a minute, where I said, okay, I don't care about running decompilation tests. I don't care about CWEs. I just want to look for this. I want to run the SEMGREP module, for example. Um, and then the other nice thing, and this is actually, these are both features that I requested and they implemented, which, like I said, they're great, great folks. Um, if it gets spun up and it's sitting there hanging, you can check and tell it, give it, say, run, what's the module that's running that's been running for a day and a half? And it'll tell you, yeah, this is the one that's hung up, right? And so you may end up, you know, killing the job, taking that module out, running it again, and all of a sudden, wow, it only took an hour. Um, or you just throw more resources at it. Um, I run a 12-core, 3.8 gigahertz AMD Ryzen, 32 gigs of RAM. This thing will consume as much CPU as you want. And it's not a, it's not a problem with Emba. Emba is essentially a wrapper for a bunch of other open source tools, and it sort of pulls everything apart, runs them in a certain, you can, you can define how many parallel processes you want to run or how many parallel tests you want to run. But it's, it's, it's time consuming and it's, it's uh, resource intensive. Um, I was joking to somebody, I wanna, if somebody wants to loan me like a 96 core server, I would love to do like a performance test and see how fast is it really that better with more cores or if it's just the software limitation. So as I mentioned, uh, it has chat GPT integration and I just played with this in the last couple of weeks. Oh wait, no, sorry, different chat GPT slide. So, ChatGPT, it has uh, 
good and bad things, as we've all been hearing about this week. Um, an experiment that I did, or actually my developers asked me to do, is they said, hey, we've, we're trying to unpack at scale 6,000 Cisco IOS firmware images that come in an ISO, but they're an encrypted binary, and we have this little like 100K application that is supposed to unpack it, but it runs in a weird version of Linux, and we can't run it in Docker, and blah, 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 blah. Can you reverse engineer this for me? And I'm like, I've used IDA like three times, but I'll give it a shot, because why not? So I open this up in IDA, and I'm digging around it. I know a little bit of RE. So I find this function called FWDEC, which to me was like, that sounds like firmware decrypt. So I pull that function up into IDA, and I get this rather, this is the actually decoded version of it, but pretend that these characters were the hexadecimal representation of ASCII's text. When I looked at it, I was like, don't really understand what this is. So I took this assembly code, dropped it into ChatGPT, and I said, what is this? ChatGPT tells me, oh, this, is, this code is a sequence of ASCII of assembly instructions, blah, 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 and it appears to be ASCII codes for characters. So I ask it, print the string of characters. What it gives me is this weird minus K, and it looks like a password. So then I pulled the rest of it apart. It was an OpenSSL command that Cisco had embedded in this tool. It was basically OpenSSL, decrypt, blah, 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 this file to this file, here's the passphrase. So I was like, okay, hey, try this. I gave it to my devil, like, run this command. He's like, it worked. It decrypted it. So then they give me like three more of these things. They're like, can you do that again? And like every single one of them worked. So in that sense, ChatGPT allowed somebody like me who's never really used IDA, this took me maybe an hour. So I was like, wow, as a, as, a, as a learning assistant, as an augmentation of, you know, I'm a relatively intelligent computer guy, this was not an area I knew. I was still able to do something without having to ask the one guy in my company who's really good with IDA to do what is essentially like kindergartner level, like reverse engineering. <laughs> I say that with a kindergartner, so I'm allowed to talk smack. The other one that I did after this, um, I decided, okay, let me check this out, and let me check, look, of, I'm not going to go, I'm not even going to zoom into this too much. I feel like you guys are getting tired of my cool, cool pointer. Um, but I essentially took a PHP file, and I said, hey, are there any vulnerabilities in this? And the fun thing with ChatGPT was it was like, that's illegal. I'm not going to tell you about that. That's hacking. So I was like, okay, and I, tool, I had to play around with the prompt for a while, and I think eventually I came to, like, I'm a computer science teacher, and I'm trying to teach people about insecure coding. Can you tell me if there's any insecure coding practices in this sample code? And then it was like, here you go. It's using this unsanitized input that you can control with your web request, and then you can call an exec function. I'm like, dude, like, why are you so difficult? Why can't you just answer the question the first time? Um, so it works. Um, it definitely works. It just, it's, it's fiddly, right? And it's, it hallucinates. <laughs> Uh, it hallucinates like I was like a VC bro at Burning Man, right? I'm, I, I don't know if you all know what Burning Man is, but it's a big party in the desert that we do in the United States where all the rich people go and take drugs for a week, and it's apparently okay. Um, but it does, and it has no real recognition of code interdependencies, so that piece of single, that single code page had the vulnerability. Um, it's not a reliable thing, because as we know, nobody puts all their code in one single page, right? You're always importing things from other code pages, you're importing things from other libraries. It also has token limitations. Um, there's only a certain amount of, of, of text you can ask ChatGPT to look at before it says, nope, not going to look at any more of this. Um, and then there's a price problem. Now, I tested um, ChatGPT3 versus GPT4, the same models against the same firmware image. GPT-3, I think, cost me 20, I paid for the API. It cost me about 20 cents, I think, to do the analysis, and then I tried GPT-4, um, and what I'll show you here, GPT-4 costs like five bucks, but when we're talking about the code, so I say, okay, it's this, you'll notice GNS auto-align PHP, and it says potential vulnerabilities, blah, 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 Here's this device ID. It's not been sanitized. This can lead to path traversal. Attackers allowing the attacker to access arbitrary files. Then I took the patched version, right? And they had fixed this by wrapping this command, wrapping this, this exec call in what they called a sanitary escape shell parameter. So it was taking this and it was making sure that you weren't giving it any weird command injections. I give it the patched version, and ChatGPT is like, hey, this code, there's a, this device ID is taken directly from the user input, and blah, 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 and you can do SQL injection. The problem was is it didn't understand to look and say, okay, this call that's wrapping this exec call is actually calling a sanitization method in a different piece of code. So it was like, the vulnerability is still there. Um, so it's not there yet. And maybe, you know, I'm going to play with prompts, and, I, and maybe there's a better way to do this, maybe a different LLM instead of ChatGPT. 
Um, I don't know this stuff, but we just hired a guy that does, so I'm going to be picking his brain. Um, but it's not, it's not there yet. Uh, Miko did a really good talk. This keynote this morning was amazing. He's talking about how AI may be able to find vulnerabilities. I think, personally, we're probably a couple years off from that. Having worked for MSRC, having seen how much effort it takes for people to turn a blue screen of death into a working POC, into a fully functional, like, weaponized exploit, um, I used to drop $300,000 at a time on people that could do this against Hyper-V. There's like five people in the world that can do that. Now, if AI can, we're going to be in a world of hurt, as will Azure. So some adjacent research, doing good. Some adjacent research to this that uh, kind of motivated me for some of my other work. Um, this company, OneKey, and I'm in no way bagging on them. If they're, I know they're a European company, so don't go telling them, oh, this guy's talking a whole bunch of crap about you. So they did a couple blogs um, this year, and you know, industrial routers and things that are infrastructure-based is kind of where my company is trying to look at. Um, we're, like I said, we don't do ICSOT. There's a lot of other companies that are in that space, but we're looking at the other, the stuff that's not ICS, but it is sort of ICS. So these were interesting to me. And their blog came out, and they built this platform. It's an analysis platform. Like I said, you upload a firmware image to it. And so they pulled this up. And so they've got, this is the same, I'm using the same code example because it's kind of, let's stay on the same page. But their platform is like, oh, look, here's this thing. Oh, it's calling device ID. It's doing this stuff. And then runs an exec. I think I, they trimmed out the exec part. But I was like, OK, interesting. Their platform does this. I wonder if Emba can do this. We have found a bug in SEMGREP that they fixed. Lo and behold, SEMGREP says, hey, this can lead to command injection. So I was like, cool, the open source free version of a tool just did what a paid for commercial solution did. I found the same vuln in the same place. So that kind of got me thinking. Uh, after two blogs within a span of a couple months, I was like, um, I wonder if there's any other things that could be found out there. And then I, you know, I usually get enough knowledge, and then I'm like, OK, let's go do something scary. Let's go find the dead bodies, which is what we're about to talk about. I love that scene. <laughs> so I ended up going and said, OK, this one key blog, the, the two blogs use that exact same screenshot from their platform, down to the extraction path that Binwalk uses. And Binwalk basically starts to do things, and it just kind of generates a random number and sticks it into the file path. And I'm like, there's no way that two different firmware images have the exact same extraction path. So I was like, if it's that identical, they're looking at the same code. Um, I grabbed the code from the, uh, the, end, the companies that they had analyzed, took it apart in Emba, and found you know, it, it dumps it out in it nicely. It, it leaves you a copy of all of the stuff that it unpacks. So you can then go in and look at each file, and you can check out their configs and what have you. What I found was their web server, and I found their GUI. I was like, OK, let's look at this. Um, let's find this GUI. Let's see what it's using for a web server. Um, years ago, I did a bunch of talks about Shodan safaris and finding all sorts of horrible things that are connected to the internet that Shodan has indexed. So I was like, all right, let's go Shodan all the things and see if I can find it. What I found was, you'll notice kind of at the top here, this Netbox router was one of the devices that they found a vulnerability in. I find this other weird one that comes with the same hit. I was like, it doesn't say anything, but it's got the same funky web manager title. I go to the UI, and it looks the same, and it smells the same. So I go and find the firmware, and lo and behold, this is a MIDGE 2 industrial router made by a company called Raycom. I started looking at their firmware updates, and I was like, wow, yeah, they released a firmware update like a couple weeks after the second, uh, the second one key blog. So I go and pull them down. And interestingly enough, I grabbed the previous version, and I grabbed the patched version. The previous version had the vulnerability. And for a second, I was like, oh, sweet, I get to get my first CVE. I get to report a vulnerability. No, the new version came out. They patched it. They used the exact same patch that the other two vendors had used, but they never in any way documented that it was a security vulnerability. They basically just said, here's a new version of firmware. There was no advisory saying we're fixing a command injection vulnerability. So if you're a, you know, a train company and you have a lot of these running on your trains, you don't know, you know, people don't upgrade things unless they have a reason, right? And if it's just like, hey, it's an update, the IT folks or the security people are like, we have too many other things to do. We're not going to install an update if we don't know it contains a vulnerability. So don't go do this. Um, but you can imagine there's 180-ish or 100-something of these things that are on the public internet. Also seems weird that you'd want to put a train industrial router on the public internet, but that's a conversation for another time. 
This is the back door that we found. Um, this was interesting, and this was very widely covered in the tech news in this uh, back in May. Our platform, I'm not gonna get salesy, but our platform does some stuff. It looks at that it's stuff inside UEFI, inside your system. And we had a sales guy that went out and he basically did a proof of concept for a customer and it popped with a SMM backdoor inside his machine. So he calls up, he's like, hey, we have a false positive. This crash backdoor is a proof of concept on GitHub. No threat actor is gonna use a piece of code from GitHub. We took it apart and we realized, wait a second, this thing has a UEFI module that has a Windows binary embedded in it. And as the machine boots up, it pulls this binary out, it writes it to disk on Windows, it registers as a service, it starts it. You don't know this happens. You log into Windows, there's this service running with this funky thing that you were not told is there. Okay, when, you know, it's, it's, it's called Gigabyte Update Service. So it's like, okay, it's an updater. Not the worst thing in the world until we took that apart and realized this thing was calling out over HTTP to some DNS name from Gigabyte. It was also, it was calling out to HTTPS. However, it wasn't validating that the certificate from the site was from Gigabyte. So I could have stood up a responder or one of these DNS tools inside a network, waited till it went for an update, said, hey, I'm Gigabyte, here's the certificate, here's the binary, and because it wasn't actually checking the signatures on the binary, like it checked that it was signed because Windows requires it to be signed, but it didn't actually check if the signature was signed by Gigabyte. So for 100 bucks, I could go buy a code signing cert, I could write my malware, sign my malware, put it on this device inside your network, wait for your Gigabyte machine to update, and now I have you know, code execution. I have whatever I want because it's a service, it's running a system. This is the same technique, the, the way that it took this binary out of UEFI and put it on the system is the same technique as Lojack, Smoke, Regressor, Mosaic, Regressor, and Moon Bounce, which are believed to be either cyber criminal or like nation state backdoors. So it was an interesting thing to find from Gigabyte. Gigabyte didn't call it a vulnerability, they didn't give it a CVE. Um, they kind of released a patch and they didn't make much of a big deal about it, but the tech news already jumped on it. Um, so who knows, but yeah, it was 400 something models, um, probably tens of millions of machines out there that had this and nobody really knew. Um, interestingly enough, as we went searching around, like, hey, has anybody found this? I found some posts on Reddit from a few years back, and people were like, I've got this gigabyte mother order, and it keeps dropping something. There's this service that keeps registering, and I keep deleting it, and I keep deleting this binary, but every time I reboot, it comes back. Um, it turns out buried inside their BIOS configuration was a little toggle, and if you turned it off, it's, it was the update service. They didn't tell you this. There was no really in the documentation. It was just like, oh, this is the thing that makes sure that the device will stay updated. So, you know, multiple years, this is sitting there, living there. Nobody knows. Whether it's been exploited in the wild, I don't know. Um, probably not. Gigabyte motherboards are more gaming than, like, enterprise. But it was a fun find. Um, kind of, I don't know, it's neat. So some other stuff that I found uh, in my digging for technical dead bodies. Um, Hikvision IP cameras. So this was the one my boss wanted me to take all 8,000 models and look at the firmware. Um, we had a, an unnamed country's government contractor ask us to take a look at their camera. This, this contractor is essentially when this government says, we want to buy 20,000 security cameras, we want to make sure we don't buy them and install them and find out that they're just completely broken, so they paid us to take a look at it. So I find there's a hard-coded password on two of these accounts. This is the model of camera that we're talking about. And so Emba goes and it runs John the Ripper for me, right? So here's your hashes, it cracks it, and you'll notice three password hashes. So one, two, three, four, five, good password. Uh, and then do how for root. Does anybody here speak Chinese by chance? Nobody? Okay, good, you'll like this joke. So do how, you punch it into Google Translate. Do how means unique in Chinese. <laughs> so someone, was probably said, you need a set of unique password, and they took it very, very literally. <laughs> but they did it in Chinese, which I think is kind of amazing. I also think it's amazing that John the Ripper could crack that, but I was like, wow, they, that, is, that is better than any one, two, three, four, five, or admin, admin, or root tour. I was like, wow, I've never seen that before or to this day. So then they asked me us to do another camera, and this is the model of camera. It's not sold anywhere in the United States, and Emma pulls it apart and finds SSH host key backdoors. So this camera has three different accounts, and I've looked at them, three different accounts, where's the account names? Management, yeah, management, key management, and sole user, whatever that is. They all have uh, public keys in their home directories. So why you would do this as a camera company? 
I don't know. Is it a support thing? Um, I couldn't find any documentation about this. This camera is like a weird black box. It didn't have firmware updates. It didn't have old firmware. It was just like we had to buy this one off eBay just to be able to look at it. So I don't know whether they bought these cameras. I kind of hope they didn't. Um, but this is just, you know, like more often than not when I look at firmware, I'm finding bad things. I'm finding backdoors. I'm finding egregiously out... Uh, uh, egregiously uh, um, outdated code, right? Um, some of these other things, right? This orange box is a, another, uh, it's a 5G router for some industrial thing like um, uh, solar uh, wind power or wind turbines. Um, default passwords, it's got Linux kernels, like old kernels, that, that digi, that, that Hikvision camera had like a Linux 2 kernel. I think I've seen out of the probably 150 firmware images I've looked at, m probably two or three that run anything higher than a Linux 3 kernel. Um, shell shock, that was fun to find like 10 years later. Uh, Heartbleed everywhere, default creds. Uh, I found a DVR that had, was vulnerable to like, I think it was whatever the SM, the Samba version of, um, it was a CVS 10.0 vulnerability in Samba, right? The, the, the Linux version of, of Windows SMB. And like I said, yeah, you go through it and you say, how many vulns? It's like, yeah, I found 763 CVEs. You know, there's all these highs, uh, 199 possible exploits, three Metasploit modules. Like, is this the thing that you want to run in your network? No, but you don't know it's there, right? You're not, you buy it, you stick it in there, maybe you even update the firmware, but you have no way of knowing that this vulnerable piece of crap is in your network. And go find an article, I, I talked about this last year, but Mandiant found, um, what they believe is APT29, which is one of the Russian actors, using uh, load balancers as sort of their place to set up shop, but their C2s were security cameras, right? This is a super popular place for actors to get in. Like, um, like Joe was saying, we've got all these little devices out there, all these little things that nobody's updating, and, and actors are saying, hey, this is a place we should set up shop because your mom, your grandparents, your friends, you know, the, the pizza shop, they're not updating the firmware, it's just sitting there, so... A Russian threat actor gets in, it's like, okay, you check it back, it goes to Domino's or whatever the Belgian version of Domino's pizza is. Nobody's going to see this, and even if they do, they're not going to be able to catch them. So some of the other fun things that I found um, was some serial to Ethernet devices, right? I was looking at, like I said, stuff that runs in your data center. You plug that little box with the wires as an IP KVM. It's pretty dated because it has PS2 connectors and 15-pin VGA which is probably some people in this audience have never even seen these before. Um, no offense, but we're old. <laughs> uh, and it has a network connection. Um, this one was fun because it had passwordless accounts. Uh, and it used shell, it didn't have like bin bash as a shell, as a shell, it used a shell script that someone had written. And when you look down, and I'll get to the passwords in a second, when you look down at this, it was interesting, there's all these accounts and they're all root. And none of these accounts have passwords. Uh, and then they all run these weird, and I like that Eric, at least it must be their main dev, because Eric's name is attached to all these configs. Eric, wherever you are, you need to do something which is called input sanitization, and don't pass that to the command line. It basically said, what do you want to ping? You, Because uh, I pulled the shell script off the firmware, and it was like, what do you want to ping? IP address. Ping, dollar sign, one. So for those that are not initiated, that's where I can say 127.0.0.1, semicolon, netcat open a reverse shell to my machine because it'll run the ping and then a semicolon means run the next command. You're supposed to put it in quotes. It's not hard. Um, but the really one, the really scary one is Lantronics, which makes also IP KVMs. Somebody at Lantronics decided that it would be a good idea to stick the password in the logon banner. So I can go on Shonan and I can search for Lantronics and password and I guess it was maybe like a troubleshooting thing where they're like, hey, if they don't know the password, they should just like tell them the password right when they connect so they know how to log into the device. These, what is there? There's thousands of these on Shodan. That's just one example, right? This is the stuff that our infrastructure, these are the things that live in data centers, right? This isn't something you run at your house. So it's like, okay, like I said, you can't have nice things, darling, because you break them. I had to take them away. There's my Taylor Swift reference. Um, so. Let's switch to another company, and I know our keynote speaker yesterday works for Fortinet. I'm not trying to talk bad about Fortinet. I have a personal uh, issue with some of the things they do. Fortinet encrypts their firmware, so I can't look at it. Um, their firmware also has no ability to validate up until version 7.4. There's no way for you to validate the integrity of it. If you've seen the news, there's been lots of Fortinet attacks lately. They're finally adding it so that you can check the SHA-256 sums of the binaries and say, oh, this one changed. Um, 
But the fun part is you can't copy files to or from the device other than like an, a firmware image or a config file. So even if something gets hacked and dropped on your machine, the only way to do forensics is you ship the device back to Fortinet. Fortinet takes a forensic snapshot. Fortinet hands it to Mandiant. Mandiant takes it apart and writes a blog. So Bishop Fox, a few months later, a few months ago, figured out how to decrypt Fortinet firmware. Right? They did all this research. That's the link to their really interesting blog. This FortiCrack tool works great. I ran it on a couple of the images I had. So it's like, OK, that's interesting. This is going to allow security researchers to find more stuff. We're going to be able to look at things and sort of give that third-party validation. So Fortinet's response was to basically take away access to firmware unless you're a paying customer. So they said, oh, we don't like you doing this. We don't want security researchers looking at our firmware. So we will say, you can't just set up a free account and download our firmware images. You have to have a support contract. All we'll give you is the VMs. Like I said, it's a bold strategy. Let's we'll see if it works. Right? So, like I said, some of the research roadblocks we run into is support contracts. We have proprietary formats. Sometimes it's a tar file with a password, which is kind of a weird way to secure firmware, but it, it's effective. Um, they encrypt things, and then a lot of the like the big HVAC companies and the data center like hardware, they won't give away firmware unless you're literally a uh, an authorized reseller. Like it's distributors only. Like even as a customer, you can't get the firmware updated from them. You have to call your vendor. Your vendor gets the firmware. Your vendor shows up and installs it. Um, and then app-based updating. This is common with printers and uh, projection systems, like whatever is projecting this screen. That's probably a Crestron. You update a Crestron by using a Windows application that downloads the firmware update and then pushes up to the Crestron. There's no way to actually get this firmware yourself and take it apart, unless you maybe set up an SSL proxy, and that's just way too much work for me. But the point I'm trying to make is this is making it worse. right? These group, uh, I think it was Red Balloon, um, they found all these vulnerabilities in Siemens PLCs, and if you notice, it took them a year to figure out how to unpack this firmware. Right? The guys from Red Balloon are brilliant, um, but if it's taking them a year to take apart firmware for just like a small model, a series of models of one device, like that doesn't scale. Right? We can't do this if the vendors are going to continue to sort of like security through obscurity. We'll pack our stuff so you can't look inside it. Because once they do, then everyone's like, oh my god, it's like the next Stuxnet. We found all these vulnerabilities that were basically just hidden inside encryption. Here's some of the vendors you can't look at. Do you, if you have a data center, you've got one of these. Like I said, there's a Crestron probably up there. These are companies that make door security systems, fire systems, halon systems that pump out, tox or pump out gas that will kill a human being if you, it takes away the oxygen. Um, you know, fire suppression, securities, you've got um, just everything, right? It's, it's basically all the stuff that you don't think about that we rely on. Like the air conditioning here is probably running Honeywell. Right? It's, it's crazy. So I'm almost running out of time. I am running out of time. So some closing thoughts. Uh, everything runs firmware. Um, as Miko pointed out today or this morning, that the sort of the, one of the revolutions we're seeing is that you know, at first it was um, you know, everything has electricity, and now everything has connectivity. Um, so millions of new attack surfaces are connected to the internet every day. All these IoT cameras, all these routers, all these you know, widgets that connect online. So this is going to continue to be an attack problem. The thing that's spooky is that with Moore's Law, and like he pointed out, you've got this supercomputer in your pocket, the chips that run firmware are going to become increasingly powerful. There's more and more capabilities. You know, you get like an ESP32 controller. Like, that's probably more powerful than my first desktop, right? It's a little tiny chip. You know, it fits on your thumbnail. Um, so these things will become more, will become more reliant on this, and the, the code that's running these things is not getting the scrutiny that it should. It's not getting the scrutiny that like Windows does or that iOS does. And the research community is small. Um, there's no bounty programs that I know of that say, hey, come break our firmware on our door controllers or break our firmware on the things that control you know, the water or the electricity in your city. So if we don't have the support and we don't have the community. And so in this sense, the attackers will always have the upper hand. right? Fortinet encrypting their firmware images didn't stop the Chinese from hacking them. Right? They, when the PLC, or PLC, PLA wants to get in, they go and buy a device. They take it apart. They spend all the time they need to because they know when they find a zero day, half of the world is vulnerable. Right? So, I mean, even here, the people's view up. They just, a blog came out the other day from the government, CISA and the NSA, and some other, I think some other agencies around the world saying, China has been caught. They're basically hacking into Cisco routers and they're dropping embedded backdoored firmware images on these things to keep like persistent control on them. This like eye chart here is a list of all the popular vulnerabilities that China is using. I think half of those are like network devices that are running firmware. So, not a super positive uh, ending. But what I might like to to close on this is I 
if you're curious about a place to start research, if this, if this is interesting you, firmware security, um, it's a lot easier to get your first CVE here. Like, you're not going to get your first CVE on Hyper-V. You will get your first CVE on, like, an IP camera. Um, here's a bunch of reference material. My slides will go up on GitHub later today or tomorrow. And uh, if you have any questions, um, now would be the time. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Throw it at him, throw it at him. <laughs> we knew that was going to happen. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is we're all a bunch of like, computer nerds that probably didn't play a lot of sports, so it's fun to watch us try to throw a square ball at each other. What happened to the previous mic? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think we decided to play with this one at the end. Cool. So two questions from my side. So one is... Um, you know, like if I have my Mac, I can install Little Snitch. I can install Knock Knock, and I will like have some protections of like this thing that I installed and what it's trying to do. What's kind of like the opportunities in firmware? Like, is someone innovating in that area to try to figure out besides just like constantly monitoring your network traffic to understand if it's your firmware is trying to cloud? Um, Tom might kill me for this, but my company is the only company that makes a Mac firmware security solution. Honestly. Like, there is, there is no one else that does that. And you're, that unfortunately, no one else, if it catches it as a virus, so I didn't even get into some of the Black Lotus bootkit stuff. Like, most companies can catch Black Lotus because the installer is flagged as malicious code. I have a bash bunny in my bag if anybody wants to watch me bypass your security controls and take your bootloader over. Um, it bypasses everything. So unfortunately, no, there's not really anything you as an end user can do right now. And the other question is, uh, you try to like explain like this felt a little bit day two of like you kind of learn your basics, and now you can kind of like dive in, into like analysis of the firmwares, download them, you kind of understand the process and how you have to do it. But before you even start, there's like a massive kind of learning curve I feel with firmware, right? Like you have to like there. Them, it, you, do, you don't have really a try hack me for firmware, like, you know, like in hack the box, there's not as much material as it is for just hacking VMs in your spare time. Yeah. So the, I guess maybe the point I forgot to make was I didn't dump firmware off of anything here, right? If you want to learn how to do that, Pablo had, teaches a class on how to do that. Um, I was basically just going to vendor sites and downloading it. But you're right, there is a certain amount of a learning curve to get to this place. I came into this company, I knew network security, network device firmware security, and like attack surface like enumeration. I've been in a constant learning the last year and a half, and so like I said, this was kind of me wanting to share my journey. I am a SME or subject matter expert in a lot of places. I'm not a subject matter expert here yet, so I just wanted to say like, look, this is a thing that you, you are all capable of doing this. You just gotta start playing with the tools and banging on it. Find me on social media if you're curious. I'll answer whatever questions I can. Was there any particular courses or books that you just like, um, I don't know that there's any. I, don't, I can't keep talking about my company because we do teach those classes. But um, <laughs> <laughs> Tom's like, you're only here for four times. You don't come back for a fifth. <laughs> um, no, I don't. You, there, is a, there is some hardware hacking books. I believe that No Starch Press sells some uh, books on like hardware hacking. Um, it's good to have that sort of foundational knowledge. But really what it comes down to is a lot of this stuff, it's firmware, but it's just Linux, right? It's just Linux. All of these vulnerabilities are simply Linux bones. There's nothing low level. I'm not finding Spectre Meltdown. I'm not like doing side channel attacks. These are like circa 2001 vulnerabilities in an ancient version of Linux that happens to run a camera. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Good catch. Oh, you got another one up here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should stop at the start at the top and just throw, like come down the hill. Duck. <laughs> we should have been doing this the whole time, Tom. This is this is amazing. This is so much fun. Good catch. All right. So a few years ago, I got to do a lot of research into automotive security, which included like decompiling firmware images and taking a look at what was inside of that. But now I'm more in sort of the generic or general security direction. And I was wondering, okay, once you get over that 
initial hurdle, and you, I mean, in my case, understand how the ECU works, how the CAN network works, how do you keep those skills fresh if you, if there's like the big push of the more traditional cybersecurity market to focus on other subjects? I mean, I feel like it, it to me, this is a passion and a hobby. I mean, it, it, it kind of comes down to what, can you find a job in something that, that you like to do? Can you, I mean, we buy gear off of eBay all the time just to hack around on it. Um, it, it's because it's a small industry, there's only a few companies that are doing this. So, you know, it's not like, I want to go be a SOC analyst, and you, there's a thousand companies looking for SOC analysts. So, like, it's cool that you got to do ECU stuff. I've never gotten to hack around with cars, but staying current and staying fresh, I don't think that that's as hard as you might think it is. This stuff doesn't advance that quickly. Right, it's not like it's changing every day. A lot of this, like I said, a lot of this gear is running 10, 15 year old versions of Linux. So it's like, you know, it, it, the, even the new stuff isn't coming out with the most up to date, you know, Linux firmware it's, or Linux operating system. So it's, yeah, it is going to be a certain amount of like used to being passionate and sticking with it. But like I said, I don't, I don't think that it's going to, the, the field is going to advance that quickly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nicely done. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to maybe address the elephant in the room and ask for the reference of your funny zooming pointer because it looks oh. very nice. <laughs> this is a Logitech Spotlight. Okay, thank you. It's about it 100, just a it's 100 US question. dollars on Amazon, for, at least for me. <laughs> thank and you very much. And I don't get a commission. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> oh, no, no. I have to walk the fine line. I can't, I can't be selling things, but at a certain point, we are the only company that does a lot of this, so. Uh, we're right on time for the next speaker. Thank you so much, and thank you, Tom, for having me back again.